from fun to facts, or rather the lack of them. I have to warn you, this is going to be terribly boring. Those who don't want to take the risk of getting bored should leave immediately and get back after lunch. Uh, for those who do take the risk, uh, I'll be happy to share my investigation with you. And since many of you know SOQS very well, I'm sure you'll be able to supply me with the information that I actually lack. Um, It's an adopted truth that in 1934, the education at SOQS, now part of Kiel, was reorganized according to the standards of Bauhaus Dessau. That is only partly true, and that's what I shall try to explore. Since no research has been done on this, I, have to ha I had to start from scratch, and the result is accordingly, and my conclusions are more like hypotheses. Bauhaus was in many ways a cons consequence of the Weimar Republic. It was a country's first attempt at a parliamentary democracy, which represented a new and modern spirit that paved the way for modernization and innovation. Further, it was a response to the country's increasing urbanization and industrialization, which created demand for affordable furniture for smaller living places, uh, which could be manufactured by industrial methods. Many of Germany's art schools underwent reforms. Bauhaus was one of them. What was particular with Bauhaus, and how was the teaching organized? Walter Gropius' idea was the creation anti-academic education uh, based on ideals from the medieval guilds. Therefore, the teachers were called masters, and the students apprentices or journeymen. Workshops, uh, not uh, regular studios or, or, or just uh, auditoriums, were to provide the basis for the teaching. Workshop training was already an important element in the courses offered by several reformed schools of arts and crafts elsewhere in Germany. What was to make the Bauhaus different was a tandem system of workshop teaching. Apprentices were to be instructed not only by masters of each particular craft, but also by fine artists. The former would teach method and technique, while the latter, working in close cooperation with the craftsmen, would introduce the students to the mysteries of creativity and help them to achieve a formal language of their own. These teachers were to be known as masters of form, while the craftsmen, theoretically their equals, were called workshop masters. And here is an example of the timetable at that time. Uh, the nature of the preliminary course was something that um, distinguished uh, Bauhaus from all other reformed schools in Germany. It soon became a crucial part of the curriculum and after a preliminary course of one year's duration, the students were allowed to stay at the school for a maximum of four years. Another important factor, which is often forgotten, was that Bauhaus was a community. Both students and teachers were, lived at the campus, and they even grew their own groceries. And sometimes they starved. As an avant-garde centre in opposition to the mainstream culture, it was met with opposition in its immediate uh, environment. 
and rationalization and economization in production were meant to serve community, but did not square with German traditionalism. In order to get an understanding of the situation at SOKS, it's necessary to go back in time. Tiny Skolen, founded in 1818, was to educate artists, but also constructors and engineers and artisans. The common didactical denominator was drawing both technical and freehand, by ways of copying models. Since the very beginning, there was always a tension between the various professional fields. There was also a tension between national traditions and new international ideas. In 1969, um, the government forced through a stronger emphasis on the education of artisans. Uh, then, in 1909, Statens Kunstakademi, the Academy of Art, was established as a higher education for, pictori for pictorial artists as a separate institution. And then, two years later, in 1911, Tainer School was renamed Statens Holmwerks og Kunstindustri School, the School of Crafts and Applied Art. The new name indicated an ambition to adapt the education to the needs for more industrialized based production combined with artistic standards. In 1904, the school moved into the new building uh, with the Oslo Museum of Applied Art in another part of the same building. Um, at that time, the museum was very much a didactic institution and worked for developing applied art of high quality based on the ideas of the modern movement as well as national traditions. The common location made it possible for the students to study the museum's historical collections but also to cooperate in order to stimulate the production of a modern applied art. The school's director from 1912 to 34, the architect Henrik Bull, held a conservative view and did little to follow up contemporary ideas. The education still comprised several artisanal professions, like carpenters, house painters, um, shoemakers, you name it. The majority of the students belonged to this category. The subjects taught comprised calculation, accountancy, etc., etc. The higher levels offered drawing, uh, mainly in the form of copying, well, some drawing all the way, but still the higher levels emphasis more on drawing, mainly in the form of copying historical works from plates. As a reaction to this situation, but also as a reaction to the emerging modernistic views one of the teachers, Ernevald Tempt, a decorative painter, started Skolen for, Bruk, for Prydkunst, the School of Decorative Art. Its aim was to offer a craft education based on national folk traditions. It started in 1926, but closed after two, only two years. Now, uh, I come to what I should like to call the Pritz era, the period between the, the two world wars and a bit afterwards. So this was a situation when Bull retired and Jakob Tostrup Pritz took over the, in the autumn of 1934. He represented the fourth generation of the Tostrup family, owner of the flourishing and highly esteemed goldsmith firm Tostrup. In 1914, he had designed a special collection for Norway's Jubilee exhibition, which was renowned for its modern style. Here's an example of this. And then an example of his, of his work from the 30s. 
Um, since the same year, he had been working at SOQS as head of the Goldsmiths department. He was also engaged in organizational work, most particularly as co-founder and board member of the Association Foreningen Brukskunst, the Association of Applied Art, which functioned as a locomotive for modernistic design in Norway. The model was Deutsche Werkbund and partly Svenska Slöjtföreningen, the Swedish Society of Crafts and Design which uh, its influential leader, Gregor Paulson, who is author of the similar book, I'm sure you know, Vakrare Vardagsvara, More Beautiful Things for Everyday Life, published in 1919. In the era of growing industrialization, one of Jakob Pritz's main concerns was to keep up the standards and qualities of arts and crafts, and at the same time enable machine production. In his own words, in, and my translation, if we are to take industry into account and work aesthetically within real industrial art, there has to be a stronger demand on technology and treatment of materials. Sense of form and materials will be the two main requirements. The style will be according to the characteristics of the material and the machine. As director, as it was called in the, the 30s, Pritz immediately, that is in the autumn of 1934, started to update the education by engaging young artists, architects and designers. Uh, some of them were um, Per Kroh, a famous painter, uh, the metalsmith Sigurd Alf Eriksson, uh, and the architect, Arne Korsman. Uh, was, they were given le two lectures on contemporary themes. Korsman spoke, spoke about functionalism, and the art historian Knut Greve spoke about applied art. Sadly, the contents of these lectures are not known. Further, Pritz started to upgrade the workshops and to hire artisans as assistant teachers an arrangement that was later expanded to employing a full-time foreman in each workshop. But the Bauhaus arrangement of one master of workshop and one master of form um, uh, with equal standings was probably never uh, planned. Pritz's master plan was to establish Skolen for Brukskunst, a higher education for craftspeople and designers, this consisted of an introductory, an introductory course uh, of one year's duration, which comprised various kinds of drawing, form and color, followed by two years education, which eventually could be added by one or two years course that led to a diploma degree. The plan was to uh, present it to the Ministry of Education in 1936 and was approved the next year. Arne Korsmo started to work at SOS in the autumn of 1934 and was made a central person in reform work. Apart from being one of the leading elitist architects in Norway, he had, a, had several interior design commissions and had displayed furniture at Foreningen Brukskunst's exhibitions and was therefore a natural choice. He succeeded the former director Henrik Bull as teacher of the so-called Honverksklasse <laughs> 1, uh, later called Möbelklassen, uh, for the furniture class, and later again Treklassen, <coughs> the wood class. It was kind of finally to become the Department of Furniture and Interior Architecture. During Bull's reign, the students were taught to make <coughs> furniture based on historical models and artisanal methods. Artistic expression and spatial totality was regarded as belonging to the architect's domain. Cosmo experienced the circumstances as outdated, to say the least. In 1951, he described it like this. <coughs> 
17 years ago, when the unassigned, as a fate would have it, entered these medieval walls, the department, if it could be called so, occupied oneself uh, with dividing the time between making graveyard fences, pleated plush curtains in styles from the atmosphere of interior decorators. <coughs> With Pristus' blessing, he immediately introduced new ideas. He taught the students to design spatial unities in small apartments arranged with lightweight furniture that could be serially produced. Instead of the traditional suites of huge and heavy furniture, he considered it necessary to give knowledge not only in furniture, but of colour, form and space. He called his approach Rumkunst, <coughs> spatial art. He tried to stimulate the development of standard types of furniture, fit for serial production and modern life. In this way, he contributed to the modernization of Norwegian furniture design, as well as the birth of the first generation of interior architects. However, his reforms did not include the introduction of tubular steel furniture. It was, kind of, um, was, was very characteristic for Bauhaus furniture. He stayed true to the traditional material of wood. The workshop for the class did not contain equipment for anything but wood, as far as I found. And this might either be a consequence of, the re consequence of or the reason for the limitation. Um, I haven't found the reason for it. It could have been a concentration on single materials, on uh, one single material for each department, um, or it might also be due to financial reasons. There were really hard times. Koshmo got his architectural degree at the Norwegian Institute of Technology in Trondheim in 1926. And he got a very classical education. But he soon turned to modernism, spanning from art deco, as you can see here, to functionalism. And among his ideals were the Dutch architect Willem de Dock, as we can see in his Villa Damham from 1932. First and foremost, it was Le Corbusier, uh, as is obvious in Villa Stenersen from 1936. In uh, 1929, he made a study tour to Europe, where he visited Italy, Germany and the Netherlands. He went to Frankfurt, where he probably saw the Weisenhof Siedlung. Uh, it was organized by Deutsche Werkbund, uh, which showed modernistic houses and furnishings by the Bauhaus teachers, as well as uh, Le Corbusier. There is no mention of any visit to Dessa. The same year as Koshbo, 1934, Sjellaug Hörlos, educated as a goldsmith on the Jakobritz, later as a weaver in Denmark, was hired as an assistant teacher in what was called Ornamentklassen, the ornament class. It was later to become two ornament classes. I can't explain exactly why. But in this class, ornament, colour and drawing of patterns for textiles and other materials were the main subject fields. Weaving had undergone a period of low status and there was no possibility of workshop training for those who wanted to specialise in weaving. In 1934, Holmweg's Klasse II was renamed Textilklassen, the textile class. Its workshop was upgraded and the teaching now including weaving techniques. Uh, at what point uh, this uh, transformation into being able to, to, to mm, really be weaving uh, is unclear. Um, when Hörlas became the uh, head of the department in 1948, Jacquard, Obstar and plain weaving looms were again taken into use. I don't know exactly when all this happened. 
in Hurdal's own work um, here for Oslo Town Hall, I cannot find any trace of Bauer's influence, neither have I find it in any of her pupils' works, but of, sure, of course I can't guarantee that. The architect Knut Knutsen also contributed to the modernization of SOKS. Like Koshmo, he was engaged by Pritz in 1934, but had a less prominent position. Earlier the same year, he had published an article on modern furniture in the journal Biggekunst, where he urged for the necessity, the necessity of quality in mass production with an implicit reference to the work of Deutsche Werkbund. The artist and architect Arne E. Holm contributed with lectures in analytical form from 1938 to 1947. The goldsmith Torbjörn Lee Jörgensen, one of Pritz's former students, was a teacher of ornament from 1939 to 59. And we must remember the ornament of that, that was a very, very important uh, theme or subject theme. And Torbjörn Lee Jörgensen knew the Bauhausler Marianne Brandt, who was married to the Norwegian artist <coughs> Erik Brandt, and he might have been inspired by Bauhaus in this way. One more person should be mentioned, the art historian Thor B. Kjellan. In 1918, he and Pritz were the main persons in the establishment of Foreningen Brukskunst. Um, the, the Association of Applied Art. In 1928, he attained the position as the director of the Museum of Oslo Museum of Applied Art. He was a main contributor to the implementation of modernism by ways of his companionship with Pritz at the raising exhibitions, uh, publishing, and his teaching in art history for Essoquais. In his book on the goldsmith firm Tostrup, published in 1932, uh, he presented an illustration of Marianne Brandt's famous tea and coffee set and described it as German, with no mention of its origin of production. As for the students who graduated, two of the most modernistic ones were Nora Gulbransen and Grete Pritz. The ceramicist Nora Gulbransen's work as a creative leader of Postgrund's Porcelainsfabrik, a position that she had attained thanks to the lobbying of Chelan and Pritz, was indeed modernistic, but it included many inspiration sources from Art Deco to Russian constructivism. Peter Pritz Kittelsen, who was a daughter of Jakob Fritz and later was to become the wife of Anna Koshmo, graduated from the Goldsmiths Department in 1941, and her diploma work is one of the more significant traces of Bauer's influence. But neither Gulbranson nor Pritz Kittelsen ever expressed any relation to Bauhaus. The common denominator for Pritz and his companions' views may be summarized uh, like this. An ambition to create a style suitable for the modern era that was not based on historical models. To facilitate the creation of affordable industrial manufactured objects. To develop standardized types. They were crazy with standardized types that was suitable for industrial production. Such objects were believed to have simple forms with little or no ornament. This is based on the ideas of the German architect Hermann Mortesius, leader of the organization Deutsche Werkbund. In spite of the aim of making affordable products, the social dimension was generally not so strong and absolutely not politically radical. Rather, I should like to say it was bourgeois. 
Prince's father, Thorolf Prince, had represented the Conservative Party, Høyre, in Norwegian Parliament. The ideas were a mixture of conceptions from Deutsche Werkbund, Svenska Slöjtforeningen and Le Corbusier. Maybe Bauhaus, but I, I haven't found out too much about it. Through all the discussions, there is no mention of Bauhaus, nor of its leader, Walter Corpius. Cosmo wrote that the education took place, citing, with the Bauhaus Bücher, so to say, in my hands, but that was as late as 1956. That was a long time after he had uh, met representatives at a new Bauhaus in the US. However, except for the emphasis on types, on which Corpius was rather ambivalent, uh, as was his relation to Mothesius and the Werkbund, the ideas fitted in with Corpius' slogan of 1923, Arts and Technology, a new unity. As a contrast, Le Corbusier was often mentioned and his work was put forward several times by both Cosmo and Chelan. This is also significant for most articles written in the journal Bigger Kunst and other journals and uh, Bernd Heiberg's book Sleek Vi Vi Bo. Uh, this is how we want to live from 1935 displayed German and French furniture taken from German contemporary literature. Uh, Le Corbusier's uh, chaise longue uh, was often uh, was there. Um, and um, the rest of, of uh, unknown uh, origin, both tubular steel and wood. In 1933, one year before the reform work started at Essequois, Le Corbusier visited Oslo by invitation of the Oslo branch of the Norwegian Architects Association. The visit got a uh, lot of publicity and surely boosted the, his esteem in Norway. In spite of the aspirations and the reforms uh, that were realised, the education as a whole stayed very much at the same at Essequois. That's expressed by the teacher and former student, Kairi Thoriusen, it kept uh, many of its uh, traditional or even conservative contents, like studies of historical objects in the Oslo Museum of Applied Art and the Norwegian Museum of Cultural History, and copying from books with plates in the library. More importantly, the school continued to function as a vocational school. The Second World War put a halt to the reform work and in the first years after the war, national idioms were in high esteem. But from the 1950s, uh, 49-50, along with the high demand for goods and the accelerating industrialization, the ideas from the 30s were partly rejuvenated. The US had become the new home of the many Bauhäusler who had to flee from Germany in the 30s. Gropius started working at Harvard University in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Illinois. Uh, Mies and uh, Mies van der Rohe had established a new Bauhaus, now the Illinois Institute of Design, IIT, with Laszlo Maholi Nagy uh, as one of the teachers. The new Bauhaus soon became an ideal for European design community. Uh, one of its first visitors from Norway was Arne Koshvall, or two. I should say. It was Arne Kosmo and Greta Fritz Kittelsen, and they met both Gropius and Mies. The visit resulted, and I should say, um, Greta was fascinated by the work of, of uh, Maholi Nagy, and she had him as a teacher. Um, the visit resulted in a Nordic summer course in design in, at Desaquais in 1952 with guest teachers from IIT. The course fu functioned as an eye-opener to a new and modern approach to design methods and teaching. It had a great impact and resulted in integrating IIT-inspired methods. This included both design and freehand drawing. Generally, it led to a freer experimentation with space, form and materials. Koshmo even got the budget to build full-scale living, 
spaces in 1952, right after the war, when we lacked everything. They were equipped with furniture made of synthetic materials, um, uh, where the principle of uh, flexibility was followed to the extreme. Sorry, I couldn't find it in color. It's wonderful in color. Um, a chapter in the Exoquest yearbook, uh, probably written by Cosmo, states that the summer course made it clear to us how the Americans at the Institute of Design worked freely with drawing, modeling and experimentation in connection with three-dimensional expression. The same was the case with surfaces. Um, Structure, color and materials. They made use of modern technical tools, treatment of structures with machines in wood and metals, plastic and paper. They also used photo photographic and lighting methods in connection with it. And further, construction doesn't start with the shell, the outer form, but from within, with a natural technical expression and its potentials in form. In this way, any secondary copying of historic styles, stylistic forms, will be impossible. The teacher of freehand drawing, Kylie Torjusen, included movement and bodily feeling in space in her teaching, sometimes accompanied by music. What was to signify the drawing courses of Kylie Torjusen was, in her own words, the main inspiration from the summer course was to bring into the teaching the movability and sense of space that exists in all human beings and that, is, uh, that has its origin in the liberty and the mobility that's inherited in all nature. By emotional training in drawing, modelling and colour that's close to plastic art, gymnastics and rhythmical movement, partly accompanied by um, with music, the human being will be emancipated. The impulsivity, imagination and feelings get a greater scope that may be utilised in the shaping of forms. Further, design course was seminal to the idea of establishing an ed education in industrial design, released from all relation to crafts. The Ulm School of Design in Germany, which was a German post-war offspring of the Bauhaus, also contributed to this. The founder of the industrial design course at Desoquest in 1973, Tobias Rigg, had got many ideas from the Ulm School. I'll come to the conclusion now. SOKS has had a troubled history. The struggle for status as a higher education in crafts and design was fought along with the modernization process and certainly put a halt to it. The financial means and supply of materials were also limited. To agree, we can't possibly understand. Still, Pritz and his team managed to make substantial changes. As for models of ideals, I should like to argue that Bauhaus Weimar and Dessau was one of the many inspiration sources. Several of the teachers at SOKS got their education at German and Austrian schools, which also might have served as models. In the period between the wars, the most obvious inspiration source, sources were Deutsche Werkbund and Le Corbusier. After the Second World War, the new Bauhaus in the US played a significant role in updating the education at SOKS. To me, it seems that Bauhaus is, is one, uh, as the one and only rejuvenator of design education is a myth and a matter that needs further investigation, both at an international and national level. Uh, national, I mean, I also include Norway. Um, as Esoquest has played a major role in the development of Norwegian design, its relation to Bauhaus and other inspirational sources 
is um, uh, research on this field is highly needed. Now you're free to go off for lunch and thank you for your attention.